Okay, I think we're on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to More Than Skin Deep. Um, I'm so happy to be back here today. I know there's a bunch of you that are joining us uh, back here. Again, we were here this afternoon, and we have an amazing guest today, um, and that's why probably a lot of you are back here. Uh, today, we're, we're actually talking about how to lose weight for good, and our guest is Dr. Russ Lomdieu. Don't even try to spell that <laughs> or pronounce it. But I love, I love, love, love what he is all about. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of his credits. He's, he's one of the most well-respected weight loss and personal success coaches in New York City, so we're very lucky to have him with us today and, and in the Hamptons. Dr. Russ, I, you know what's funny is I, that was the name that I thought I gave you. I didn't realize that other people were calling you that too. <laughs> but it makes sense. Dr. Russ is not, he's not only a doctor of physical therapy, but, um, but he's a real world expert in weight loss because he's lost over 230 pounds and has maintained it for over 10 years. And he has this incredible uh, system. Uh, is that the right word to say it? Welcome, Dr. Russ. Thank you, Nia. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to hang out with you, as we say. So, thank you. Oh, no. Are you kidding? We're, we're so blessed to have you here today. Um, as we know, More Than Skin Deep is, Deep is really something, it was really a conversation I wanted to open up because being in, in, the, in the public eye for the majority of my adult life, people always would come to me and ask me certain questions. They would ask me, how can I be beautiful? And how can I be in shape? How can I lose weight? And mm -hmm. they're really, it's all very, very connected because I think it's just about being the best you that you can be. And when, you, when you're in that place where you're able to express who you are freely, there's just this absolutely unique power and beauty and light that comes forth. And so to be able to have someone like you explain to us how you took one thing that is so important and impactful in someone's life. You're talking about, I don't even like to call it weight loss because I, I like that you call it weight loss for good because really what you're doing is you're, you're living the healthiest life you can live. And it's not just about diets or exercise. So that being said, here you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I called the program Lose Weight for Good for two reasons. First of all, it, it seems like so many people can lose weight, and so few people can lose weight and keep it off. And, and that seems to be a major issue, so I thought, well, lose weight for good. But the, the double entendre there is that you're actually losing weight for your own good and for the good of the people you love. And ultimately for the good of the, of the world if you choose to leverage your new health and well-being and outlook on life to help other people. And certainly that's been a major shift in my life is that with this new vitality, I'm more able to do all sorts of great things. So it's, it's lose weight for good, meaning lose weight forever, and lose weight for good, meaning it's just for the good of everyone. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. When I, when I have met people who... Um, who lost a tremendous amount of weight and then struggled to keep it off, it's almost, a, it's almost it, it wears on them more. It seems to wear on them more that they're not able to keep it off. Like, am I just this way? Is that just the way that I am? But when I, I meet people who have been able to change their life in a way where they're just no longer obese and they are living a different life, they're, their whole way of feeling about themselves and therefore how they express that completely changes. They're empowered. They are, it is for good, like that double entendre you were talking about. When mm -hmm. you lose it for good and you find how to live that new way, it is for the betterment of everybody else because you're adding your light to the sum of the rest of the world in the most powerful way. That's absolutely true. Uh, you know, you mentioned that People who lose weight and gain it back and lose weight and gain it back, they struggle in so many ways, and not the least of which is it does wear on their psyche. How do I know this? Because by the time I was 410 pounds, I had already lost and gained 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I've already been there, and I can speak with absolute authority that it does mess with your brain. 
and you do become convinced that there's no way you can do this. When I work with people, one of the first thing I work on is their belief system. And one of the first beliefs that we try to install is the belief that you can. If you don't, if you need to lose 200 pounds and you don't believe you can lose 200 pounds, then your mind is going to look for ways to give up. Mm. Because why are you going to do it if you don't believe you can do it? So the first belief we can install is, okay, what do you, you know, what do you believe you can do? And in my case, uh, I believe that I could lose 10 pounds. So I lost 10 pounds and I felt so good about it that I lost it again. And I lost it again and again and again and again and again and again. And that's how I start my lectures. When I do workshops, I always get up there and say, well, I've lost 10 pounds. And people are like, oh, gosh, what kind of weight loss expert is this? Mm. And then after I say that 23 times, yeah. then it drives it home. At the end of the day, no matter how much weight you have to lose, you really only need to lose it 10 pounds or one pound or one ounce at a time. Right. So uh, being able to install that belief, being able to change someone's worldview about their own ability right. is really key to making this work. You talk about retraining your brain and never having to diet again. Um, is that is that what you're talking about right there? Is it little tiny steps or is it a big giant? How do you go about retraining your brain? Well, the there's there's two things I want to talk about with that. First of all, it's always little tiny steps, and it's it's a concept that I call betterness. It's it's giving yourself permission to stop being or stop trying to be perfect, and releasing yourself to just striving to be better. Now, for some people, those are really tiny steps. And for some people, they can take bigger leaps. And certainly, when you get used to making little tiny steps, you can train yourself to take bigger leaps. Everyone needs to start with the little steps. You know, when, when people start on a diet, okay, what they do is they, you know, they get into a phone booth and they start taking off their shirt and they, they, they have this big red X on their chest, right? <laughs> and, and they think, all right, I'm going to be a weight loss Superman and I'm going to take that Empire State Building that is my weight loss and I'm going to leap it in a single bound. And what do you think happens to them? They run headlong into the wall of the building and fall right. flat on their face. Yeah. How many of you out there have ever had that experience that you start out and you're all you're a Superman of weight loss or Superwoman of weight loss. You try to leap that tall building and you fall flat on your face. Well, let me tell you something. After 25 years of being a physical therapist, I can tell you anybody can get to the top of the Empire State Building using the stairs. No matter how bad off they look, if they take it just one step at a time, even if their leg is broken, even if they've had you know any number of disabling conditions, it was my job to get people upstairs. So I kind of understand that that concept. So think about that. You know, if, if I ask everyone on the call if they think that they could run 10 miles, how many people do you think would say yes? Mm. Not, many. Not many, right? Well, yeah. what if I said you're allowed to run that 10 miles six feet a day? How many people think they could run the 10 miles? If they were going to have a lot of hands up, how many people can run six feet a day? I never said how long you had to take. You could take as long as you need. Then, but by the time you're done, you will have run 10 miles. It's the same thing with betterness, by taking it one step at a time. And so how do you then go about um, choosing what that first step or the first few steps are so that you can succeed at them rather than taking too big of a leap and failing right out the gate? One of the ways that we help people to understand what the first step is, is I ask, I ask people to contemplate this question. What is the smallest thing that you can start doing right now that will make the biggest impact on your weight? Just one thing. The smallest thing you can do right now that will make the biggest impact on your weight, and it's something that you'll be able to do every day for as long as it takes. 
most people know what that is. Most people know what that is, whether it's, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to stop drinking soda. Or but the key is the smallest thing that will make the biggest impact. And then the next question I ask them, well, what's the smallest thing you can stop doing today that will make the biggest impact? And keep not doing it right. for as long as it takes. And that's right. usually a that's really good way to start. I, I find that you know when people ask me, um, what kind of what is my diet like? What do I eat? My question back to them is, what are you trying to achieve? And when they say, how do you stay in shape? My question to you is, what kind of shape do you want to be in? Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in shape a lot of different shapes, depending on what I was trying to achieve. And and for the most part, I would say, you know, people a lot of times they're beginning in a completely different place than where I'm beginning. So if I want to improve my fitness, for me, maybe that's adding another mile to this or another two miles of that. Mm -hmm. But for the average person, it might mean walking an extra block. Or it might mean, okay, instead of drinking four Cokes a day, try drinking one in smaller, in four separate increments. Just, you know, sure. back it yeah. off. Pick that one little thing. And they don't realize how incredibly impactful just that little thing that's done on a regular basis, what, how much of an impact that little thing will have. There's nothing more powerful than consistency. There's nothing more powerful. I don't care how small the change is. If you do it consistently, it's going to have a tremendous impact on your life. That's a, you know, and that's, that is something else that I learned, not learned, but you kind of remind yourself, you know, I, I go, sometimes I'll go to a yoga class or I'll go to this or I'll go to that and I'll say, okay, I'm still able to do that. But that's not practicing it. Mm -hmm. Being able to get up and do it, or yeah, I can, you know, I can eat well for this day. That's not the same as eating well every day. I'm no. either I'm practicing eating well, or I'm okay with eating well one day. The practice of it is what makes everything. Absolutely, it's it's a it's about creating a, a routine or a discipline, or I think the word that we throw around a lot is a lifestyle. Yeah. It's, you know, it's creating a lifestyle. And, you know, I have clients that throw around that word all the time. It's like, I know, it's a lifestyle. Well, where does that lifestyle come from? That lifestyle comes from who you are as a person. And constantly being willing, we talked last time we spoke, we talked about raising your standards. And mm -hmm. it's that, that ability to constantly be honest with yourself and look at what you're doing and say, how can I do this better? That's what betterness really is all about, is that yes. you need to have that awareness component. Yes. And uh, I remember, you know, when I started studying this material and I studied weight loss material and business success material and, and uh, personal success material, and I remember listening to Tony Robbins who said, the quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask yourself. And I mm. thought, wow, this guy's good. Yeah. yeah, that is <laughs> good. As I started to develop my program, and no disrespect to Tony, I, I realized there were a few components missing from that formula. Hmm. And what I realized is these were the components. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask yourself, multiplied by the frequency that you ask them, raised to the power of the integrity of the answers and that turned out to be for me the complete formula because yeah. what I found is while and I was perfectly willing to lie to myself uh. therefore my results may be not so good mm -hmm. so as I started to realize it's the constant asking of those quality questions and then being willing to give yourself the honest answer and just right. call it what it is, right. whatever it is. And, and, um, uh, on elements of life, we, you know, one of the things that, that we talk about is, um, is women's tendency to try to you know, reach that, that perfect place of balance or perfection. Like one day I'm going to have it all together, I'm going to be so organized, and I'm going to have just the right amount of food and just the right amount of exercise, just the right amount of time with the kids, just the right amount of work, and it's all, it's all going to be lined up perfectly and that's going to be balanced and, and great. But 
what the saying that we came up there with there is perfection is constant transformation. It's yeah. being you know willing to take that next step and let go of even what used to work in order to receive what's going to work moving forward. But it's I, constant transformation. I love that. You know, when I went through um, my training to become a personal success coach, we have this thing called the wheel of life, okay? And what you mm -hmm. do is you have this circle. And you go from the center of the circle, and there's numbers, one, two, three, four, five, out to the edge. And if for every line represents a component of your life. So, for instance, um, job satisfaction. Well, you give it a five. And then, you know, your weight, you give it a two. So that when the wheel comes out, it looks like it's flat in all the areas of your life that aren't going the way you want. And you look at this wheel and you're like, oh, crap, my wheel is flat. <laughs> and so you're like, you're desperately thinking, oh, I'm so out of balance. And you're sitting there. And as I'm going through this training, I said, this is all wrong. It's all wrong. Because... There are times in your life where you'll concentrate on certain things and those will be the things that flourish while okay. other things aren't really ready to flourish. And I said, it's not a wheel of life. It's a flower. And some petals get all the nourishment and they grow a little bit more. And other petals don't quite get as much nourishment. And it's okay that all the petals in your flower are not the same length or health. What's not okay is to grow one big petal and let the rest of them die. Hmm. So it's, it's a new concept of balance where everything doesn't have to be perfect. Right. They just have to be nourished. Right. Well, well, and I think what it is is it's not really achieving a perfect balance. It's, it's, it's not achieving a perfect imbalance. So <laughs> when we, yeah. you know, I used to think about balance as being one of those scales where you get just as much on the left, just enough on the right, and then whoop, there they are. But then I started thinking about it more like um, a musical metronome. Mm -hmm. It keeps moving back and forth, and if it's weighted just right, it will continue moving back and forth. And, the, and if it's weighted just a little bit too much, it will eventually just stop on one yeah. side or the other. That's and so funny, it's really life is so dynamic. Yeah, exactly. It's all about being willing to do what you're saying. Ask the questions, answer them honestly. Where's the integrity in, in the answers, you know? Sure, sure. Now, this, one of the things that I, I, I work with people is I'm like, I say, what's your definition of integrity? Mm -hmm. And almost always they say, well, it's, it's truth. It's in, a, in fact, integrity comes from the root word to be whole. And when you have integrity, it means that you're whole. Okay. Isn't it interesting how we link that to honesty? I, yes. Oh, I like that. Look at me. I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> of course it means, because when, you, when you've upset the integrity of the structure of something, you, you've upset the, the wholeness. The, yeah, right. exactly. Right. And, and we, through the evolution of our language, we have just assumed that to be, uh, you know, uh, synonymous with honesty, and as well it should be. So when we're honest with ourselves, we can be more whole, more, so it's, more integrated. And it sounds to me like this journey that you have to take in, the, in this life change in terms of um, losing weight and being as healthfully you as you can possibly be, the journey requires a lot of forgiveness. It, re it requires a lot of forgiveness, a lot of self-compassion, a lot of the simultaneous ability to, to love yourself while simultaneously recognizing, I want more for me. Mm -hmm. So it's not, about, it's not about beating yourself up. It's about loving who you are and loving that person enough to do whatever it takes to make their life better and while at the same time being just aggravated enough about where you are to want to move out of that space. You, you know, sometimes, sometimes you've got to get really annoyed to make a change. And that's okay as long as you're annoyed at the behaviors that put you there, not at the person who put you there. Because right. as soon as you, you're never going to be able to help yourself if you don't like yourself. And because you're not going to listen to yourself. I mean, let's face it, you don't listen to the people you don't like. Right, so, right. And so... Would you say there's a lot of um, there's a huge aspect of 
appreci self appreciation. You know, for even thinking about it. You know, I, I I do this with my daughter. She's a teenager, and, and she's you know incredibly hormonal. But it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's you look right now. <laughs> no, but but so am I sometimes. But she'll um, she's also very self aware. So she'll have one of those emotional outbursts, and then she'll spend ten times the amount of time just beating herself up for it. Sure. And, you, and I'm like, well, but I tell her, look, the, the, you've won already in that you're aware. You're standing outside yourself, seeing yourself acting out in a way that you, is just uncalled for. Mm -hmm. That's enough. You can see it and you call it. Now let it go and move on. And so that awareness is a really, really important thing. And that's one of the things you talk about in your program, too, the importance of self-awareness. It's, it's paramount important. Uh, and um, I mean, by the way, just what a great, what a great way to be a mom to be able to kind of give her that perspective. And it's important that we use those same parenting skills on ourselves. Right. And it's um, it's good parenting. And sometimes <laughs> we need to be our own parent. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. Self awareness is real important. It's true. It's true. So and then you talk about so you okay. So the first step you said was was about having people believe that they can yeah, absolutely. is the first thing. And the second thing is, is to begin with small steps. What small thing can you take away? What small thing can you add in that's going to have a, have a huge effect? Do you, is, is there any time that you implement? Do you say, okay, do this for a week or, and then come back to me with how that's making you feel? What, how do you put a, um, some kind of a structure in what they're doing? Mm -hmm. um. That's a great question. Can I can I back up just one click? Sure. Okay. I'm gonna I want to take a moment and quote Mahatma, Mahatma Mahatma Gandhi. He said, "Your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny." And what I love about that quote is that, first of all, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. It per makes perfect sense. But the most liberating part of that quote is that you can change your destiny by changing your beliefs. And what happens with people when they what happens with people when they go on a diet? If they're so focused on the actions, they want to change their actions. But the problem is they haven't gone back to the beginning of the equation and worked on their beliefs and thoughts. Mm. And that's why people literally short circuit themselves. Because if you look at it, that, understand that Mahatma Gandhi was simply a great observer of humanity. And what he observed is that this is how human beings operate. It's like a system that helps them to operate, mm -hmm. kind of like an operating system. Right. Now, everybody who's had a computer understands what an operating system is, right? Well, what happens if you wanted to update your operating system by just plugging in like the last few lines of code? What if, what if Bill Gates decided, well, I'm not going to really update all of Windows. I'm just going to take a few lines of code and change it. Well, what happens is it, it literally short circuits the program. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when people try to go on a diet and work on only the actions. It really needs to start with the beliefs. And what I talk about with clients is literally to update their operating system. And that's why we start with beliefs. Because one and day I was sitting there reading that quote going, that's it. There's the secret. Gandhi had it the whole time. Right. So... I just wanted to go back and talk a little bit about why beliefs became the foundation of this system. So you ask, you know, how much time do we, when do we check in? How much time do I let pass? Generally, in the early stages of my relationship with a client, I ask them to check in weekly because it is the block of time that we measure everything. 
every Monday is a new week and every Sunday is the end and every Monday is a new week. So we already have that kind of programmed in our mind that that, mm -hmm. is, that is the universal block of time. There is a day, a week, and a month. So literally, you know, no sense in checking in every day. So there's a new beginning every week. It's a new chance to get it right. Every week makes perfect sense. So because it is ingrained in our culture, I ask people to check in with me every week. I ask them to check in with themselves uh, every week with weighing and, and rewriting their, their goals. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, um, one of the ways I do that is I have um, a very specific system I use to help people create what I call commitment. Because actually, I don't really use the word goals that much. Because, well, let's face it, if you're standing in a, a soccer field with a soccer ball in front of you and there's a goal and you go to kick the ball, you're either going to make it or you're not going to make it, right? I mean, there's a chance you're not going to do it. But a commitment, that's different. Right. It's not negotiable. You're going to do it. Right. So. Right off the bat, I'm, try, I'm using language that's helping people to realize that this is for real. There's no missing. Right. Every single one of our commitments has a purpose. Every single One of the reasons people don't meet their commitments is it's just not that important to them. Right. So if you link it to something important, I'm not going to eat any candy this week because... I know that that's going to help me to reach my goal, to lose weight, whatever it is. Um, they also have to be ready. Some people know it's the best thing for them, but just not ready to do it. How many times have you ever knew that getting rid of something was the best thing you could do for yourself and you just weren't ready to do it? Has that ever yeah. happened? Yes, you know? absolutely. I well, think a lot of people, too, are fearful, right? I mean, fear, they have the fear of failure. Um, Ambrose Redmoon, I think this was her name, had a, a quote about courage, and and it was a, it, the quote is something like this, and I hope I don't bastardize this, but <laughs> it, you, you're going to be fine because I hope I don't say it wrong. Um, courage is not the absence of fear, but the belief that something is more important. That was spot on, because when you get my program, you'll see that that quote is in the program. Oh, yay! <laughs> I that's love like, that quote. <laughs> the quote is in the program. And that's exactly right. It's not the absence of fear. It's the knowledge that there is something more important than the fear. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that is incredibly relevant. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much literature, even all the way back to Viktor Frankl, uh, who who says that human beings are capable of doing incredible things when they have a good purpose. Frederick Nietzsche said, you know, he who has, uh, he who has a why can endure almost any how. Mm -hmm. So connecting to a purpose. So we talked about creating a, a firm foundation of belief. Right. And belief is an idea that you're absolutely convinced is true. It may or may not actually be true. It's okay. your version of reality. Right. It's an idea that you're convinced is true. So I started to think about, well, why is that so? Why am I so convinced this is true? So I want you to imagine a plank, okay? And the, the plank is the idea. And underneath the idea are supports. And that's the evidence. Where does the evidence come from? Well, if your parents ever said anything about that idea. Well, you remember that, even if your parents are long gone, okay? Those are your earliest influences, the media, the internet. Anyone that you come in contact with, your prior experience, books you've read, newspapers, all of these things, okay? Even your religious faith comes in as evidence. And they're going to support that belief. All beliefs are constructed this way, a plank, and supports. Now, there's only two kinds of beliefs. You know what two kinds of belief, what the two kinds of beliefs are, Nia? I'm putting No, you on actually I don't. So, fair enough. A lot of people want but to But they're say both true. planks. <laughs> that's right. A lot of people want to say true or untrue. But oh, okay. that's not entirely okay. correct. The only two types of beliefs are empowering beliefs uh, and limiting beliefs. That's it. That's right. That's it. So I want you to imagine this plank and the supports underneath it. 
An empowering belief is where you stand on top of the plank. It gives you an elevated perspective of the world. It gives you the ability to see opportunities and to take advantage of them. And when you stack one empowering belief on top of another, it makes a great tower and you can just climb to whatever success you want. So a limiting belief, on the other hand, is I want you to imagine that you're below the plank mm -hmm. and those supports, they're the bars of your prison cell. And the belief literally holds you down. Right. How do you know the difference between an empowering and a limiting belief is you simply ask yourself the question, is this belief helping me right now? Is this belief serving me to get what I want? Doesn't matter if it's true or it's not true. Doesn't matter. If it's serving you, it's an empowering belief. And if it's not, it's a limiting belief. So now it's your job to take your limiting beliefs and simultaneously question the evidence that's supporting it while building an empowering belief that is in, that it will directly challenge it. Right. Does all this make sense or am I kind of going off? No, no, you totally make sense to me. And I, I think that's, um, gosh, it makes absolute sense to me. And I think, you know, that's why forgiveness is really important and a willingness to transform is really important because I know what I know today and I have to be willing tomorrow to turn around and look back and go, whoa, I have a little bit more of the piece of puzzle right now and that's cool. That doesn't make it bad yesterday. It just means, whoo, I'm moving forward today. Yeah. And so oh, it's, that's, that's how we want to evolve. You know, one of the other things we say, if you're not creating your life, it's creating you. So you're going to be subject to whatever comes your way. There's so many things we don't have control of. But when we, when we make conscious choices like what you're talking about, standing in a place of power, what is, what is the perspective that is going to serve me and allow me and empower me to move forward and grow from here rather than standing they're looking back at what I didn't get done yesterday. I'm standing here going, hey, here's what I did get done. Here's what I get to do today. Sure. That absolutely. gives me energy and forward momentum. And I'm allowed to continue to grow and learn. I am allowed to do that. And that is the perspective that empowers me. And so I completely get what you're talking about. And, and there's a reason that the rear view mirror on a car is small. Because if you spent all of your time looking in the rear view mirror, you'd probably run into things as you were driving. Right. It's just, the rear view mirror is just there for reference. It's just a learning tool. It's just for you to say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm bad. I, just what you said, I learned from yesterday. Yeah. Now, I want to take just a moment and talk about the difference between true and untrue beliefs. Because yeah. somebody said, well, what, you know, what if your empowering beliefs aren't true? How do you know? We don't really know anything for sure. We really don't. <laughs> I, you really don't. And I want to tell you a quick story. So last year was actually my 10-year anniversary of having lost this 200 pounds, right? So mm -hmm. I wanted to do something cool and exciting and new and different, and I wanted to raise money for the American Diabetes Association. So I hatched this crazy plan that I was going to kayak single-handedly around the circumference of Long Island, New York. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Long Island, New York, that's almost, that's like 270 miles. Whew. So I had this whole fundraiser set up. I had the time reserved. I had planned all the tides, painstaking planning going into this. And um, uh, there was a hurricane off Bermuda when I left. So what happened was when I left Montauk, I encountered 20 foot waves, oh. 20 feet. It's like going up a roller coaster, and then, of course, you go, right, okay. So, obviously, I'm a little edged. I never should, the, the, the Coast Guard called me up and said, we really don't think you should be doing this. And my chase boat, the safety boat, yeah, sure. said, that, said that they weren't going out. This was crazy. But I go out anyway. Are you kidding? So Wait, were those waves breaking? Was it 20-foot swells? Well, Okay, good question. See, that's that's a good question that a surfer would ask. Yeah, right. <laughs> Still, you'd um, be throwing up over the edge. But, so you, you'll understand this. The I planned the tide. I planned the outgoing tide, and we were getting the swells from the hurricane. Yeah. So they were steep but not breaking. The first wave I took actually broke. It was not twenty feet. The first wave I took I actually broke, and I and I went through it with the kayak. And so that was my introduction to the ocean that day. You punched the lip. 
punch yeah. through the lip. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And nevertheless, everything that I had neatly arranged on my deck under the bungee cords was no longer hanging oh. by its their safety line. Okay, so here's the point, though. I got beyond the where the current was was rushing and the waves were steeping up, and I got to a more comfortable place where they were just swells, okay? But I had to turn my boat so the swells were coming on the side of the boat, so it was very precarious. Sure. And I could hear the surf hitting the rocks in Montauk. Now, there's no, there's no soft entry there. It's all cliff. So I'm hearing, and it sounds like bones crushing. Yeah. So I'm barely holding my own. I realize if I flip over, there's no safe way to the beach. And right at that moment, a dorsal fin pops up next to me. Now, I have a choice here. I have a choice. <laughs> now, immediately, I can't identify the dorsal fin, so I'm thinking the worst. I'm thinking this is a shark, is and this, this is really bad. Is that? Yeah. Right? This is bad. <laughs> And immediately what happened is I lost my focus, I started to lose my balance, and I started to become ineffective in my ability to move forward and away from that place. Wow. And I said wow. to myself, this belief is not serving me. Right. So at that moment, I decided to believe this was a dolphin. And I further decided to believe that where there are dolphins, there are probably no sharks. So not only is this not a shark, but there are no sharks in the area. It didn't matter whether that belief was true or not, because if that shark was going to attack me, it was going to attack me whether I believed it was a shark or a puffer fish. It didn't matter. So by choosing to believe it was a dolphin, I was able to maintain my focus, concentrate on what was important, and frankly, just get the hell out of there. Right. So it didn't matter whether it was true or not. I created an empowering belief that got me out of that trouble. Right. Now, how many of you have ever been paralyzed by fear, paralyzed by your limiting beliefs, and they're just not serving you. Yeah. I'm not saying to go into the world blissfully ignorant. I'm saying make an honest assessment about whether your beliefs are serving you. It doesn't matter whether they're true or not. Honestly, I don't know what that dorsal fin was, and I'll never know. It doesn't matter. Right. The truth wasn't available to me, so I created the truth that worked for me. Right. That's what I did. So thank you for allowing me to indulge. No, no, no. I, I think that's, um, well, this is obviously is not just applicable when I'm fixing my seat. Is okay. it just applicable to, um, <laughs> how's your seat? That would uh, be fine. <laughs> but um, not just applicable to weight loss, but to anything in life. Yeah. Uh, this is really what it's about. And you, you have this system that you're actually, you're giving away five of these. Yeah. Today. Five Lean and, Weight for Good audio program. Yeah. Uh, well, and this is this is fascinating to me because I have been so paralyzed by questions that people have asking me about losing weight and being healthy because I don't know where to begin. There isn't a, a super simple um, answer. And so that you've been able to put it in a system is incredible to me. Can you tell us a little bit about this system that you're actually giving away today? Absolutely. The Lose Weight for Good system that I'm going to be giving away today is basically the culmination of my life's work in weight loss. Not only what I did myself to lose weight, but in my study of weight loss experts and business experts and personal success experts, I, I found out that diets don't work. So mm -hmm. I stopped studying the diet literature and started studying what, other, what, what made for general success. And you, you mentioned it before, so much of what I teach is applicable everywhere in life. And I love it when I do weight loss lectures and, and somebody in the audience will come up to me, they want to talk to me, and they go, Doc Russ, do you know you can use this stuff anywhere in your life? And I look at them <laughs> and I said, I had no idea. <laughs> so... So a lot of what I teach is based on good science and weight loss, good science and behavior change, and a lot of what we've learned from personal success gurus like Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and, and all those great classic guys. I put it into a uh, audio program. It's about 14 hours of me speaking. So if you've uh, if you've already gotten bored of my voice, you probably aren't going to want this program. And also a workbook 
to help you sit down and actually map out what you need to do in order to lose weight. There is a system in there for creating commitment. There's a system in there for changing beliefs. Um, there is a system in there, which is what I call uh, building the lighthouse. And what I learned is that most people don't get what they want because they don't know what they want. They mm. honestly don't know. Now, you know you want to lose weight, but what about beyond that? Mm. What's really connecting you to that weight loss? So many people lose weight to fit into a pair of jeans. They fit into a pair of jeans exactly once, and then they start gaining the weight back. Why? Because their vision didn't extend beyond those jeans. So when I talk about building this lighthouse, it's literally creating your weight loss destination in your mind. And we start by building the firm foundation of the lighthouse by building your beliefs. And then what we do is we build the tower of the lighthouse, that structure that elevates the lighthouse above the horizon so that you can see it from a long distance off. That's your vision. And I help people to connect with what their life is going to be like after they've lost weight. To connect with what it feels like to be healthy and vibrant and capable. And then on top of that vision, I put the most important piece. The one piece that's going to draw you out of the darkness from a long distance away, and that's the light on top of the lighthouse. That's your purpose. So if you can imagine this three-component system is how we start. We help you build beliefs. We help you create a vision. Now we give you a, a real purpose. It's almost impossible not to be able to achieve what you want to achieve when those three components are exactly right. And then we also teach you that when you get to that lighthouse, it's okay to build another one. <laughs> right, right. And I do find, it's funny because go, even um, at this stage in my life, I have, I mean, I can't wait to get hold of those things and listen to them because I, I know what I enjoy, but I am in that place in my life where I'm like, what do I really want? Yeah. I want to inspire people, but how? You know, I'm, I'm in this place in my life where what do I really, really want? And because I don't have that clear vision, mm -hmm. I'm just doing, I'm just kind of moving my feet, sharing okay. what I know how to share. But I, I feel like I'm waiting for some kind of a clear vision on, on how I'm supposed to proceed from here. I can't wait until you get that program. And we'll talk more about it. I'd love to, I'd love to work with you to help flesh that vision out. Because oh. I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe very strongly that, you know, you're, you're a force of nature. And I think that I see very big, big things for you. You're perfectly situated. You've got all these great ideas. You're hitting on all cylinders. People already know who you are. You are poised to do exactly what you want to do. And, well, and, and what I want, you know, here's the, the funny thing is, is that what I really want to do is what I'm supposed to do. And I don't know clearly what that okay. what that is. But I, I feel like it's going to present itself. There's so many avenues I could choose. Mm -hmm. I know this. I mean I know I mean I was talking to a producer today and he what are we getting into my like my life coaching here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is me putting it out there so you understand that this is the reason that I connected with Dr. Russ is because I get these things in my life on every level. It what you're teaching pertains to every aspect of everyone's life. It is not just weight loss. It is not just what am I doing with my career. It's not just how you, you know, um, how you raise your kids. It is how you live your life. And so this is why I'm, I love having this conversation. But today I was talking with a producer who I did a movie with last year and he said, well, Mia, don't, don't you have something you really want to take to a film company or take to a network or do you really want to direct? And I just thought, I don't know. Bring me something that inspires me. What I I already know I can direct. I've done it. But sure. is, am I? Is there something that I'm just dying to get out there and direct? Not yet. But if it presented itself, maybe. I know that I can. But I know all of it is incredibly time consuming, and I don't want to fully commit myself in a place that might take me away from where I'm supposed to be implementing my greatest power for the for the good of everyone else. Yeah, and, and I think this is a great conversation to have in the context of this Hangout, and I'll tell you why. Because, first of all, 
I want everybody to know it's okay to tread water. It's okay to take a little time, look around. Sometimes that's what life's all about. And, and people ask me all the time about weight loss plateaus, just to kind of bring this back to weight loss for a second. And, you know, obviously they, they hit a weight loss plateau and they're very uncomfortable. They, they, they don't want to be there. They want to be losing weight. They feel like they've hit a brick wall. And they walk into my office and I sit down with them and I hear the story of this plateau. And they, they're waiting for me to look at them and say, what's wrong with you? When in fact, I look at them and I go, that is awesome. <laughs> and they want to, I swear, some people, they want to punch me in the face when I say that. But here's the truth. I let them get a little upset with me. And they, what do you mean that's awesome? Are you crazy? And I said, listen, you've lost weight before and you've gained it back, right? Yes. So you've, had, you've struggled with maintaining your weight, haven't you? Yes. What have you been doing on this plateau? You finally are getting what you want. You're maintaining your weight. Okay. You're not maintaining it where you want to maintain it. I get that. But you are learning valuable skills on how to maintain weight. I want you to stop and look around. I want you to take notes. I want you to learn valuable lessons. Those lessons are going to come back later on. I said, so for that purpose, it's really, really valuable that they embrace those plateaus because they're finally able to do something that they've never been able to do. Right. And let me ask you another, let me ask you a question, Mia. There have been times in your life where you've, you have felt incredibly powerful, incredibly productive, like you knew when, like you, you knew you were doing the right thing. There have been times in your life, right? Mm -hmm. There are some, there are some lessons to be learned from those times. And I'm going to guess one of the lessons is you had that clear vision. And it didn't come to you all at once. It evolved over time. And that's something that when I work with people, I say, become your own success detective. Start to pull back into your own life and say, well, where were my greatest successes? Where did I feel most fulfilled? When was I most productive? And start to say, well, how can I reproduce that now? Or what lessons did I learn from that? So, uh, and, I, and I suspect we're going to talk more about that because I, I think I'd like, I think I really would like to work with you and, and help you get that vision. Well, well, and the other thing too is I think um, defining success is a really, that's a really important step because I think that there's, um, society lays these things upon us that say they give us measurements of success that when you really step back and look at it, you can say, well, that's really not my measurement of mm -hmm. success. You know, and so when I, so it is being able to step away from that and define it the way you want it defined and being completely at peace with that. And that's why, you know, when people say, well, when were you in the best shape of your life? I always say it was about six, seven months pregnant. Totally, that was my favorite shape. Why? Because I knew I was eating really well because I was eating for two. Right. I was, I was exercising properly. I was swimming all the time. I was in the ocean. I was doing, I was healthy and I was resting when I needed to rest. I was conscious of what was happening inside me and at total peace with whatever physical shape mm -hmm. outline that put me in. I was not concerned with anything society said in terms of what shape I was supposed to look like because yeah. I knew I was in prime condition for giving birth and that piece came with that shape and that was my fate that's why that was one of my favorite shapes it's I not about achieving that. you know it's not about achieving no cellulite on the back of my thighs for the cover of Maxim it's not about that right, that's somebody right. else's thing <laughs> Well, it's certainly not mine. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, and I think it is important to sort of give yourself permission to be whatever shape you are and to just, at some point, just enjoy who you are and what mm -hmm. you're capable of. If you want to be capable of more, that's great. Yeah. But... It is that concept of loving yourself and loving, you know, not being so hung up on what everybody thinks you should be. You know, we talked last time we talked about, you know, when you lose 200 pounds, you have a lot of loose skin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
I'm sometimes I'm very, very self conscious about it. And other times I wear it as a badge of honor. Like, hey, not everybody can have this. You know, you're gonna <laughs> lose two hundred pounds to get this. <laughs> right. You wanna walk down the beach and all those guys, you know, all muscular and they got six packs and it's like, Yeah, well I worked a lot harder for this loose skin, I can tell you that right now. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, we get to talk like that in New York. I didn't know if you know. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I know the New York talk. <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, Sue here. Wait, can I ask? Sue has a question. Yeah, I want to hear questions. Okay, question. Sue wants to know if she wants to engage in your program. Mm -hmm. What is the What are her options in terms of the ways to go about doing that? Is it purchasing the system or? Um, personal coaching with you, where can she find you? She wants all that information. Okay, um, the, the best thing to do is I think we're going to be posting my website, the Lose Weight for Good website, which is the product page. The, I take a very, very few coaching clients and um, so I haven't been, I, I don't, I, I do coaching on a very selective basis and, and that's not because I'm some kind of elitist. It's because I'm constantly now developing programs. So I only have so much time in a day and I can't do a lot of coaching. It's not Right. Well, well you want to be able to put it in a form that can be accessible to more people. Exactly. So right. the, the program is available. Now, if you go all the way through the program and you still want to talk to me, there's no problem with that. It's just we need to figure out if that's something I have time to do and, and if, if you're still willing to do it. Um, plus, I think we'd agreed that if you sign up for Nia's newsletter, then you're going to be in the running to win one of the five programs. So hopefully you'll win the program and then you won't have to worry about getting it and then you can, uh, you can have it. But if not, if for whatever reason you don't win the program, you can, uh, you can go on to my Lose Weight for Good website and uh, the, uh, the link should be live to purchase the program, which would be really good. And uh, I think I'm going to be discounting it next week, so okay, good. I'm going to the, deal right. even, the deal will be even better. Uh, our other website is I Love You to Health, and that's a little bit different concept, but maybe if there's, is there, are there any more questions? We'll take a few questions before we... Uh, Let me go look in here. How about that? Okay, Karina. Hi, Karina. Karina. Hi, Karina. Karina says that she's had a lot of troubles with self-esteem ever since she was a little girl because she's always been overweight. What is the, what is her next step to changing that? How can how can she change her help her self-esteem? I think that's what she's asking. Okay. That that's a really important question, um, and and it's it's something that I'm no stranger to. Okay, I grew up a heavy kid. Okay, I was bullied severely bullied. It wasn't popular to be the heavy kid back in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay, so um, I understand self-esteem issues. But let, let me explain something to you, and this is important. You are beautiful. You're beautiful. The fact that you're even willing to ask that question and put it out there that you have these these issues going on, the person inside is beautiful. And it's really important that you start to recognize that from the inside out. From the outside in, circle your, what, 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 we, what we used to say is circle the wagon. Find three of your best friends, people you know love you. Sit them down and ask them this question. Ask them what, name three things that you love about me. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. Now, here's the important part. Listen to them. Listen to them. Because they know you. They're going to see you in a way that you're not allowing yourself to see you in. Right. Let let them tell you how terrific you are because I don't know you. So when I say you're beautiful, you're like, yeah, who is that guy? I'm saying you're beautiful because I heard your question. And to me, I thought it was beautiful. So I have my reasons. I'm not just saying that because it's a thing to say. 
I'm asking you to then ask three more of your friends and then listen to them. Take it to heart. Let them help you change that limiting belief because that's all it is. Right. It's an idea that you're convinced is true. It's not true. Right. Does that make sense? It does to me. I think um, Karen's watching in the other room, and I have to check with her because she's actually the social worker in the group. <laughs> Hi, Karen. <laughs> she's in there somewhere. <laughs> okay, we have another question. We're going to take this question from John. And hey, John's, John. <laughs> John's question is, how long did it take you to lose all that weight and keep it off? And what if your partner doesn't support you in the wow. lifestyle changes? John, that is a great question because I wanted to talk about I love you to help anyway. So, part one, how long did it take me? Number one, the disclaimer is that the amount of time it took me to lose weight is no indication as to how long it should take anyone else to lose weight. And there's no, uh, this is not an endorsement of how safe or unsafe it was. But I actually lost the weight fairly quickly. I lost the 200 pounds in like a year and a half. Um, wow. So that was, that was fast. That was way too fast. Um, as far as your partner supporting you, that, that is a sticky problem. As a matter of fact, the the darker side of my weight loss is that after I lost the weight, I started living a very different life. I literally became a completely different person. I'm not 100% sure that the old me would even want to talk to the new me, to be quite honest with you. As I continued on this life journey, my wife continued on her life journey, but it wasn't the same. She didn't kind of come along on my journey, and it strained our marriage to the breaking point. And I don't want to see anyone ever have to go through that again. So we created I Love You to Health, and we're currently pre-launch on that program, but we created I Love You to Health to help couples become healthier together. One of the pieces of advice that I would give you is, well, the, one of the questions I would ask is, do you feel comfortable enough to have a conversation with your significant other? about creating a unified health vision, a unified vision of your future wellness? If the answer is yes, you can have that conversation. And, it, and, and it, it's a serious conversation that's like, sweetheart, I want to talk to you about our future, not just our financial future, but our physical future. I want to be able to play with our grandchildren. I want to be that cool grandfather that does awesome stuff. And you know what? I want you right next to me. I want to take care of one another for the rest of our lives on an equal level. I want to be I want to be with you forever and I want to do cool stuff. Whatever that is. If you feel you can have that conversation, then have it. If you feel you can't, if the relationship doesn't feel safe enough, I would consider now I'm not a big one to throw this out, but I would consider speaking to a professional, maybe having a, just because I say the word counselor doesn't mean that your marriage is on the rocks or it means that you're willing to make it better. And one of the best approaches for this is called EFT or emotionally focused therapy. And if you can find, if you go to, uh, if you type in emotionally focused therapy and you, you can get a referral of a therapist in your area and see if, for, you know, maybe you have to go first and then you bring your, your significant other. That's one avenue. But always start with a conversation. Where would you like this to go? And and see see if you guys can create a unified vision. Yeah, I think that's important for any aspect of your of your family. But this is such a gosh, it's such a big it's a big life change, you know, what you're talking about and and it is a lifestyle. Yeah, and sometimes the spouse resists, doesn't want to go along, is happy the way they are. And you know what? That's okay. I remember at one point during my um, my separation, my wife looked at me and she said, Russ, I get it. You want more than me. You need more than me. And I want to be more than me. Mm -hmm. And so I had created this whole culture for myself, this whole betterness culture. And she opted out. And that was okay. It's, 
doesn't mean I don't love her because I do. <laughs> it mm -hmm. just means that we couldn't share our lives mm -hmm. and we had to make that all right. And that's why you created the, the website, right? I love you to help. Because we want to help people not get to that point. We want to help people avoid that because I'll tell you, I, I don't, it's never separation, divorce, se sorting out details of your life, lives together always sucks. It's mm -hmm. always painful. And who needs the stress? Who needs the depression that goes along with that? We want to avoid that. We want to create stronger families, stronger unions. And the most responsible thing I can say to you is if you don't think you can have that conversation, find someone who can help you have those conversations. Right. Does that make sense to you, Nia? It totally does, yeah. Th that's what you're talking about, the, the EFT, right? Yeah. And someone to help you have that conversation. Therapy, yeah. yeah. Well, again, we're coming up on the on the end of our hour. Dr. Russ, I don't know how this We need happens. more hours. We, well, I, I hope you'll come back and have some more conversations with us. There's so much to be said here. There's so much to be said. Listen, and, um, go ahead. No, you go. I was going to say, and make sure, I want to make sure we have plenty of people to choose from because we're going to do a random drawing for those five Lose Weight for Good programs. And I'm really, really excited about getting those into your hands because once you get those programs in your hands, we are going to create a relationship with you. We're going to um, add you to our newsletter. And as we start to build out this website, you're going to have access to uh, all sorts of resources from us. So we're really, really excited to get those in your hands. So, Nia, do you want to tell them how they can yes. get? Uh, yeah, well, all you have to do is um, you're automatically entered to win if you sign up um, just sign up on my newsletter and it's right above the comments if you look um, just above where the comments are on this page that you're on right now there's a little green button that says newsletter so click on that sign up and that's that's how you get entered to win and then we'll contact you because we'll be collecting your email addresses and we'll contact you for your heart address so we can send you this information and we're also going to be posting all of Dr. Russ's info on Facebook so that if you want to go directly to his Facebook page, his websites, and get hold of his his um, his other programs. You can go directly there to get hold of it because it's some really incredibly powerful information that I'm so happy that we were able to share. Um, I know we've gone over, but we have. <laughs> I see Steve Massaro has shown up, <laughs> and I know I, I know Steve a little bit here, so he has a he has one last question. Sure, and I just before I answer the question, I just wanted to mention too that if you're not listening or watching this webcast through the Facebook site, what website should they go to to sign on for that same newsletter? Uh, oh, they can go. We'll just go onto my Facebook page, and it'll be right there, or they can go to niaselementsoflife.com. Okay, great. So now I want to hear Steve's question. Okay, so Steve, are you ready? He says, "I have a problem trying foods. Doesn't trying, matter what trying food. Okay, trying foods. It so doesn't matter." Foods. I think that's what he means. It doesn't matter what kind. Therefore, okay. junk food, fast food, is my best friend. How okay. do I break that mental block so I can eat so I can eat better? I had a heart attack and that didn't work. Okay. So Steve, here's what I'm here's what I'm hearing from you. You you have this identity that junk food is your best friend. That is that is a belief that that is settling down to your very core. You're personifying this junk food as if it's something that's helping you, okay? This is your best friend that from college that drinks all your beer, borrows all your money, and steals your girlfriend, okay? This this friend, this friend is not helping you, all right? And, and I think it's important to kind of get in touch with that. The other thing is that, again, realize that this is this is a belief. This is an idea that you are convinced is true. It's physiologically improbable that you are averse to all of these new flavors. What I would recommend is that you continually try new foods with a new outlook. Try to suspend the belief that you only eat what you eat. And I think what I'm hearing here is that you really believe that you're locked into this food group that you call junk food. It would be very, very important for your life, literally for your life, 
to start to challenge that belief. Start to think back to your past. Have you ever eaten more healthy things? Try one healthy food. Try it. I mean, what happens when you try something healthy? Do you do you throw up? Do you get sick? Do you get dizzy? Do you fall on the ground? Does the terrible things happen, or is it just an unpleasant experience? Because frankly, the ability to push through some of that discomfort is going to be the difference between life and death for you. So, I mean, um, it's hard for me to answer a question that has that much personal depth in this forum, but it really does come down to that belief. Well, and can I can I add to that? Isn't there, um, I know, isn't there sort of a physiological aspect to that too as well? Because junk food has so much sugar and so much salt and fat in it that physiologically speaking, isn't it like a drug where your body just kind of sort of wants it and wants it and wants it and isn't satisfied until it gets more and more and more and more. But if you commit to a couple of weeks of staying off of it and cleaning your body out of it, that your tastes will change and what you yearn for will begin to change. Is there any truth yeah. to that? I agree entirely. Um, that That's a very, very relevant point. The The issue for Steve is how can we get him to that place where he can maybe, okay, recognize that addiction and say, I need to break this. So, you know, again, it's like recognizing that this friend is not your friend. And then on the other side of it, being willing to try those other options. Because at the end of the day, if Steve removes all the junk food from his life right now, he's going to starve because he doesn't try anything new. So we need to get him to a point where he can try other stuff. And then, absolutely, detoxification is going to be key because he, you know, physiologically, your brain is craving these things. It's craving these things so much that it's actually convinced you that nothing else will do. But it's physiologically improbable, if not impossible, for that to be so. There's no way that you can be allergic to everything else on the planet, Steve, and it's important that you push through the discomfort of trying that new food to try the new food. Yeah. You know, you try, listen, try Nia's kale shake. Come on. <laughs> you know okay. you want to. <laughs> I know. You can do the kale shake. Come on, the kale shake. Come on, it's sweet. It's good. I like it. We got the kale shake. I'll be posting that a little bit later. Dr. Russ, thank you so much for being thank here you. with us. Make sure everybody that you go and you sign up for the newsletter to enter to win. Um, one of his lose weight for good systems, which can I enter? I'm I'm just gonna put my name. I'm gonna sign up for my own newsletter. Can I do that? <laughs> yes, you can. But you you're getting one anyway. I'm oh, that's you, right. You're you're like the sixth automatic winner. Woohoo! Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for joining us for more than skin deep, and uh, we're gonna post what's next in the next in the next few days. Who's coming on next? And Dr. Russ, I hope you'll join us again. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to be like one of those recurrent guests. Do Good. You know that? We're on. Oh, I would love it. I would love it. Okay, I you like guys. That. See you next time. <laughs>